The following presentation was recorded by View Digital Media at the inaugural Southeast Linux Fest in Clemson, South Carolina on June 13, 2009. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org. I, I was told that if you ever get nervous about presenting, you should imagine that your audience is nude. I don't think the people telling me that anticipated this audience, though. Um, I'm really excited about OpenStreetMap. I've been involved with OpenStreetMap for a couple of years now, and it is much too big a project to cover completely in one hour. So I hope to give, well, and I don't even have an hour. So number one, I'm going to talk fast. Uh, number two, I'm going to hit some of the highlights of what is possible. And then we can cover detailed questions about specific applications back at the um, Ontario Linux Fest booth. We'd be more than happy to, to take your questions there. Uh, feel free to ask questions during the presentations, but we may deal with them very quickly and then go on to the next slides. You are here. This is what OpenStreetMap looks like. That's actually the building that we're in at the Hendrix uh, Student Center. The, the campus map of Clemson is actually in pretty good shape, which is uh, really exciting to see. Why do we care about maps at all? Audience participation, you can actually answer. Why do we care about maps? Okay, so navigation, why else do we use maps? Okay, transportation, navigation, anything else? Topographical maps, you're a professional, you're a cheater. You just, uh, no, we, won't, we won't go back to the GIS professionals. Locate resources, absolutely. Did you look at any maps around the beginning of November last year on TV? They were kind of color-coded, red and blue, something like that. We use maps to have a look at infographics. We use maps for all kinds of data. Here's a map. Anybody know the history of this one? GIS professionals can keep quiet. OK. Um, in the mid-1800s, we didn't know where cholera came from. We thought maybe evil spirits, maybe bad air. And there was a cholera outbreak in London, England. Dr. Snow plotted the location of the sick people and found that most of them were right around this area in central London, right around Broad Street. And that's where the Broad Street pump is, where people were getting their drinking water. Eventually, Dr. Snow suggested perhaps cholera was related to water. And so that's where we, where we learned where cholera, how cholera spreads. We also use maps to argue about which side of the property line the fence should go on. Okay? So maps can be a tool. Maps can be used against you, against you. If you're not interested in where the fence is going to go, it's going to be your backyard that's getting smaller when the neighbor puts up a fence. So there are all kinds of things that we use maps for that are not just purely navigation. OpenStreetMap has been called the Wikipedia of maps. That's not a bad description. Um, OpenStreetMap is a tool set to work with geodata, but it's also a large collection of geodata. And the goal of OpenStreetMap is to provide maps to people who care about them. You need that. You need OpenStreetMap because the maps that you think of as being free may be zero cost, but they're not free as in freedom. And the basic concept of OpenStreetMap is, I'll make a map of my neighborhood and share it with you. You make a map of your neighborhood and share it with me. And eventually, with enough contributors, we've mapped everything for everybody. The key strength to OpenStreetMap is its community. There are over 125,000 contributors to OpenStreetMap in the six or so years since the uh, project started. Now, that number's out of date because I looked at it last night. Okay, the project doubles every six months or faster. Um, there are more people contributing to OpenStreetMap today than there were yesterday. Many people contribute data to OpenStreetMap using a consumer-grade handheld GPS device like this one. This sort of GPS, in, in very simple terms, works using the GPS satellite system that's orbiting the Earth. The GPS satellites are doing the electron, electronic equivalent of saying, ping, here I am, ping, here I am. And a handheld receiver on or near the surface of the Earth here receives signals from several satellites 
and then estimates where it is on the surface of the Earth or above it. Those basic GPS devices will generally tell you where you are right now. With a small configuration change, you can generally get them to record where you have been over time. You collect those tracks uh, that, that leave sort of a breadcrumb trail uh, where you travel over time, and you end up with something looking like this, wandering around doing a little survey in a neighborhood near, near where I live. While you're doing that survey, wandering around, looking at things, you can record your observations. Where's the, where's the, uh, the, the elementary school? Where's the bowling alley and where's the coffee shop? You can make those notes. Some people like to sketch a little map. Some people record turn-by-turn -turn instructions of where they find things. Some people take photos of the things that they want to put onto the map and then the editors can combine those photos with their track file so that they put the picture of the thing right on the map for you. And others like to talk into um, a uh, voice memo recorder and listen to those instructions as they do the editing on the map. You can take that information and turn it into metadata with one of the OpenStreetMap editors and contribute it to the OpenStreetMap server where it gets magically turned into an actual map. It's a pretty cool process. There are thousands of people around the world doing that, contributing data in, uh, in university campuses, in neighborhoods, uh, in national forests. Um, almost any place you can imagine to put on a map, people are putting on the map with OpenStreetMap. One, one of the ways that OpenStreetMap is encouraging people to participate and contribute to OpenStreetMap is by hosting mapping parties. Mapping parties started in the United Kingdom where our British cousins tend to like to drink a beverage or two. Um, and uh, people will get together with a goal of mapping a specific area or a specific type of point of interest. They'll divide up the territory they plan to map, go out and do the mapping, come back and contribute it to OpenStreetMap. This is a result of a mapping party and the track files that people collected at the mapping party. What kind of resolution do you have to mark things at to make it really functional for you? Um, the GPSs are generally good to about three to five meters, so three to five yards. That's plenty for, for most applications. How often do you sample the, like if I'm walking on the street, Ideally, you want to set your GPS to save a sample every second. Um, most of them will, by default, try and save internal memory. And so they'll use an algorithm to save fewer points and save memory. You don't want to use that. The, that algorithm will throw away stuff you'll want. Um, if you get enough people having uh, enough mapping parties, you can go from this empty slate. This is the map of Toronto as of uh, late 2006. And then people started mapping by mapping one interchange and then a couple of neighborhoods. And then more and more people got involved in the project. And so you can see that with the interest of just a couple of people and a little bit of free time and talking to people and getting other people excited about uh, mapping, the map of a complete city can develop and practically appear before your eyes. There's a little slowdown for bad weather here. It's a wiki, so last edit wins. Um, the community is really good about incremental improvement. So unless you know for some reason that your data is better than the previous contributor's data, why bother changing it? And so the course, over the course of the two years since late um, 2006, we see that the map of Toronto has come from an empty field to uh, pretty comprehensively mapped. We've got a couple more months left in the animation here. Um, if you look at Toronto now, it's uh, developed even further and substantially complete for the road network points of interest and uh, other things like that certainly can be, still be added to the map of Toronto. Yes? How many maps do you have from the iPhone Don't know. Okay, and I think that's the end of the... Uh, animation for the Toronto. Um, but what you, you end up with is people contributing to maps 
uh, here and there and everywhere. Yes, sir? Mm -hmm. I would suggest instead that you use the downloads that work on some of those proprietary devices from OpenStreetMap, because I've got them running on mine. And if they're not complete, then I'm, I'm creating it, uploading it, and then it Absolutely. So you get maps not, not just of Toronto, not just of Clemson University, but a map of Berlin. And not just a map of Berlin, but a map of the Berlin Zoo. Wow. <laughs> okay. You'll notice what's in the top right corner. This is an open source convention. The penguin enclosure. <laughs> it's not just a map of Berlin, but it's also a map of a, um, an amusement park and the rides at the amusement park. Uh, it's not just a map of Rotterdam, but it's a map of Rotterdam for cyclists. It's a map of Rotterdam or a map for cyclists that you can put on your GPS. Sorry, you were just a couple of slides ahead of me. <laughs> it's a, not just a map of Copenhagen, but it's a map of Copenhagen that you can print out at high resolution and give or sell to tourists because you can use OpenStreetMap data for commercial purposes if you choose to. Here's another campus map at the University of Maryland in College Park, Maryland. The students there did a great job of mapping their campus. I'm told that they were doing this for credit, so I guess they would pay a little attention to it and get, the, get out there and do some mapping. But the computer science students then deployed their own version of OpenStreetMap and customized it with routing software. So here you see how to get on the left from one part of the plant science building to the other. And on the right, after selecting the no, no stairs option in the route planner, you find you have to go around the other side of the building. So if you're on your skateboard or your Segway, you can find your way around campus at the University of Maryland. I'm sure there are some other more socially correct uses for that <laughs> software, but I. I can't imagine what they would be. So OpenStreetMap is maps of places that you've heard of and you would expect to have really good maps like New York and San Francisco. But it's also maps of places that you might not, have think, about, might not think about very often, like Cyprus, where the United Nations has been playing keep away between arguing factions over whether Cyprus should be thought of as uh, Turkish or Greek territory. Now, Cyprus is an interesting case study for OpenStreetMap and the wiki aspect of OpenStreetMap because it was the site of OpenStreetMap's first edit war. Now, the general rule in OpenStreetMap is what is on the ground is what goes into the database. There is a contributor in Cyprus who, every time he gets home at night, logs into OpenStreetMap and changes the name of his town back to the name of the town that was on the sign when he drove home that night. There's another contributor who lives away and changes it back to the name it had when his father lived there many years ago. The guy who lives away has a shell script. Now, <laughs> now OpenStreetMap does handle internationalization. You can put a separate Greek name and separate Turkish name for each object. And if, if that were enough to solve this problem, then there wouldn't have been an edit war in Cyprus, and the United Nations would not have to be there to keep people from scuffling. Uh, but that's not enough for these folks. They both want to be the default. And if we had a way to solve that, other than blacklisting IPs and you know, uh, sending separate map tiles to the, to the different people. Um, we want to know what your ideas are, how to solve this problem with human nature. We think the software tools are pretty good, but human nature we still have to work on. Um, there are maps of some other really interesting places in OpenStreetMap. Baghdad, you can see that we've got uh, Arabic names as well as um, Romanized, uh, Romanized names for some objects in Baghdad as well. Um, Kinshasa is probably one of the most dangerous places on the planet right now, and OpenStreetMap has a pretty good map of Kinshasa. Gaza City was recently redecorated, and there are some volunteers from OpenStreetMap who are on the ground there and trying to rebuild the, the maps for the people in Gaza City who need to be able to go and get their groceries and go and visit Grandma's house. Um, the result of all of these people mapping in all of these places around the world is shown in this video showing the edits from the year 2000. Are we getting any audio? 
Yeah, there's there's a little uh, background audio here, but uh, I would suggest you go have a look at the audio um... plug. Oh, I didn't plug in the audio. There. We'll go without it. Oh, there we go. Rock show. So we're zooming out from England and Europe. And each of these white flashes is one edit from one editor during 2008. And so we can see that there is activity in OpenStreetMap all around the world all year. We're going through the year 2008 two and a half times. That's why we saw it reset there for a little bit. So thank you very much to uh, ITO, ITO World and Peter Miller for that video. That's um, an awesome visual, visualization of what happened with OpenStreetMap last year. So that's what OpenStreetMap is. So why? What's the difference? Why wouldn't you just use big proprietary mapping system that somebody's already heard of? Um, they're all awesome in their own way. But they have shortcomings. And the biggest shortcoming is that for the most part, they just give you a picture of the data. Sometimes you really need access to the data. Here's one example. Um, OpenRouteService.org is based out of the University of Bonn in Germany, and they do route planning and, uh, with OpenStreetMap data. So you go to their website and you see um, the very similar OpenStreetMap slippy map interface on the right-hand side, and on the left, you can do your route planning. Um, you can choose language, you can choose whether you're traveling by vehicle, on foot, or by bicycle as well. Um, and you can choose the, the shortest route or the, the fastest route as well. Um, so like most route planners, you can you find the map of the area that you're interested in, you can assign a starting point and an ending point, and it will give you a path that it recommends for you to take for your trip. But they've also got access to a municipal traffic and construction server that tells you where there's local congestion in real time. And when you have the underlying data, instead of just having to say, well, it looks like my trip's going to be slow because the highway's congested, you can tell the software to recalculate and give you a new path. And that's something that you can only do if you have the data. If you just have these image tiles that are a picture of the data, you can't recalculate that stuff. Uh, another benefit of having the data is that you can present it in ways that are important to your application. Now, these are two images of the same area in England. On the left, you see the default rendering of the map. And on the right, you see this cycle map rendering of that same area. Um, on the left, we see the different highways color-coded by the, the type of highway, the different roads by the, by the type of uh, road that they are. On the right, we see emphasized those roads that have official cycle route designations on them. And you see the cycle route numbers as well. You also see elevation contours and hill shading. Because I hear that cyclists, sometimes they're looking for a challenging hill to climb, and other times maybe not. Um, but the cycle map is, is a good enough implementation of cartography that it was actually recognized by the British Cartographic Society at the end of 2008. So uh, congratulations to Dave Stubbs and Andy Allen who, uh, who put together the cycle map using OpenStreetMap tools and OpenStreetMap data. You can also put maps, put things on the map that commercial mapping companies just don't care about. Does anybody know what this is? These ski slopes. So you can put your ski resort on there. They're color-coded by the difficulty of the ski slopes. And the dotted black lines are lifts, and they have different icons for chairlifts and for gondolas. Um, sometimes you don't care so much about where you're going, but how big are the hills that you're going to be climbing. And, uh, and so this shows you an elevation profile 
as you follow the blue line on the left-hand side, the elevation is shown in the graph on the right-hand side. So you can see that you'll be starting at about 450 meters and then dropping down into the valley at 340 meters and then climbing up to about 500 meters on the right-hand side as you, as you finish. Yes, sir? We'll do the same thing for point-to-point, -point, straight line? Um, can do. No reason not. I don't know if... <laughs> yeah, if you have the data. Yeah. That data require the GPS pressure No. We, we don't store elevation data in OpenStreetMap. We pull in the elevation data from the SRTM mission from the space shuttle. Because yeah, because handheld GPSs are really bad at elevation, so we don't even bother with the elevation data from GPSs. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was at the beach and shown as being many, many meters below. That was a little disturbing. Um, so was there a question over here as well? Okay, very good. Um, so what are some of the other advantages of OpenStreetMap? We see the, um, here's, here's a neat one, lie close. Does anybody know about lie close? Lie close is really interesting. It's the, the little dead end street there. And if you uh, try to turn left into lie close, this is what you see on the right hand side. There is actually no lie close. Lie close is um, called a, uh, an Easter egg or a cartographic watermark or a trap street. And it was featured in a, uh, in a copyright infringement case that A to Z Maps won because somebody had copied their map and put lie close on it. So cartographers, for as long as cartographers have been spending the time to make, painstakingly make really good maps, they've been putting things on the maps that just don't exist. Things like trap streets, phantom bridges, imaginary churches, swamps of imagination because other people have been trying to copy their maps and rip them off. So if you copy any substantial area on a commercial map, chances are you're copying a couple of these trap streets or other cartographic watermarks. And that's how people generally uh, uh, prosecute their cases against you if you've been uh, copying their copyright material without permission. So, um, so when you buy a commercial map, you're buying lies. Congratul <laughs> congratulations. Um, here's an intersection in Toronto, as it was shown on uh, Google Maps up until uh, the 10th of February. I haven't checked just recently, but it's been like this for a couple of years. Here's the truth of that intersection. Okay? Now, this, this street was traffic calmed a couple of years ago. And so if you look at the aerial photos, what you see looks like a through street. But there are bollards in the way. And so if you try and drive through there, you're in for... A lot of body work, basically. Um, but you can still walk or cycle through there. You just, just can't drive through there. Um, it's not Google's fault. They buy this data from, in this case, it says here, Teleatlas. They, they might have bought it from Teleatlas or from Navtech. Those are the two big commercial vector data suppliers in North America. And Teleatlas and Navtech only collect the data for your town every two to ten years, depending on how commercially interesting your town may be. So if they haven't come since the traffic calming, you're getting old data. Um, here's another case uh, where the data is old. In this case, it's uh, on the Yahoo Maps. And again, the data was checked in, uh, February, on February 10th. It may have been updated since then. Um, Skipton Crescent was built a couple of years ago. People have been living there for quite some time. Skipton Crescent still doesn't show up on the Yahoo Maps. How can you have a housewarming party? if your house isn't on the map. So with OpenStreetMap, you can put your house on the map and have your housewarming party. Uh, there are places that are not commercially interesting to the commercial map companies. Um, in this case, Yahoo shows Reykjavik having a couple of roads. Google shows it with nothing. Um, Reykjavik may be cold and far away, but it is substantially more interesting than shown by Google or Yahoo. This is the OpenStreetMap map of Reykjavik. Um, a couple of people interested in providing maps can put together a really good map of a substantial area. You understand, because commercial mapping companies have to collect data for less than they can sell the data, why there might be small places that they're not able to map. 
Bombay is not so small. Why is it not mapped? It's not called Bombay anymore either. You'll notice it's called Mumbai in OpenStreetMap. Now, this screenshot was taken in 2008. To be fair, uh, Yahoo and Google have both caught up to OpenStreetMap, so I'd like to congratulate them on being able to match the productivity for op of OpenStreetMap in this case. How come they don't? Um, I, I, you would have to ask them. I would imagine, though, that they must have a delicate relationship with the commercial map suppliers. Or maybe that the contracts are just older than the existence of OpenStreetMap as well. Um, I'd love to see them using open data, wouldn't you? Yeah. Um, the generous licensing of OpenStreetMap. Yes, ma'am. Oh, they've changed that now, so it's it's not being um, stifled. Now, no, now downtown Beijing is not. For most of central Beijing, is not. But outside of that, I I had heard that um, even uh, mapping on the ground with a GPS was not officially permitted in Beijing as well, or in China as well. I don't know if this is true, but I do know that um, after the Beijing Olympics, there was an awful lot of new mapping that was done <laughs> after people came home, which was uh, I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, the licensing of OpenStreetMap and OpenStreetMap data allows you to do really interesting things with it, like print and sell maps you know, for tourists or for, uh, in this case, this is a, a map on the left, a uh, map for young tourists in um, Copenhagen. On the right is a map for a, uh, an open source GIS conference held in Germany. Uh, but you could even take a map from OpenStreetMap and use it as the cover of your next great novel, sell millions of copies, make a huge fortune, and it's okay. You don't have to get a special license to be able to use uh, the map images from OpenStreetMap uh, in interesting ways. The, it's a Creative Commons license, so you just do as required by the Creative Commons attribution share alike, and you're off to the races. And, uh, and, and another uh, interesting benefit of OpenStreetMap is that you can get all of the software. You, know, you can get all of the software, you can run your own local copy, you can experiment with it, you can write new code to go along with it, um, but you can run OpenStreetMap just as it's run on the server uh, in, uh, in England. Yes? What form is the data in now? Is it like a MySQL database? Or? Currently Postgres. It was it was my sequel up until uh, just a couple of months ago at the last API change. Okay. So how do you get started with OpenStreetMap? I've said it's a huge project. I, I've said that I can't possibly tell you everything about it, but I can get you started on it. You can go to the OpenStreetMap website and register for an account. That's all the permission you need to start contributing to the wiki map of everything. It takes an email address. Once you get the... Uh, confirmation email, you can log in. Don't click the edit button while you're watching the whole world. It takes a long time to download all of that into your browser, <laughs> and the server people will be very upset. <laughs> it won't actually let you download the whole world into your browser. Um, zoom into a place that you find interesting, maybe just a couple of blocks or just a couple of buildings to start with. And then you can click on the edit button. There's an, there is actually an in-browser editor. It's a Flash-based editor uh, for OpenStreetMap. There are other editors as well, um, but uh, this one you don't have to download. And so you can choose to either edit with save or edit live. Think of the edit with save as being a practice mode. You can make all of the changes you like on the map, and until you press the save button, you don't have to worry about whether you did it right or not. If you're using the edit live, mode, every time you select something new, the last thing you edited gets uploaded live. So something to be aware of while you're uh, working with OpenStreetMap. Here is 
the um, campus of Clemson in uh, offline editing mode. So we could uh, then go about selecting something and then changing its attributes or moving it or adding something to the map. Play around with the editor, get used to how the editing tools work, um, and maybe come to the um, Ontario Linux Fest booth and I'll uh, put the editor on my laptop and let you play with it there. Was there a question? Nope? Okay. Yes? That, um, that uh, brand name GPS that you mentioned is closed proprietary hardware and closed software as far as I know. I'm, I'm unaware of any open source software that's available for that device. Um, some of their proprietary data format has been reverse engineered, so we're able to load OpenStreetMap data onto their device, but I'm not aware of any uh, modifications to their software that are available. Um, I'm going to get uh, you first, and then you. Yep. I know that um, a lot of the proprietary web pages, they use vector graphics and all that for the rerouting and the, and the zooming in and out and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. How, um, with the whatever client application you can use to make use of the of the open street map data, mm -hmm. uh, obviously it's not just a picture of, of a city. Mm -hmm. how, how, really quickly, how, how does that work? I mean, like, can I use it to reroute and, and all that kind of fun stuff? Uh, absolutely. Well, we saw routing in the um, open route service. Uh, demonstration a, a few slides ago. The data is stored as vectors in the database. Um, in the browser, by default, you're seeing rendered pixels. So it's, it is just a picture of the data in the browser by default because it works really well in the browser. Um, if you want an underlying data la layer as well, um, you can download that separately and then start working with that as well. Uh, and then there was a question. Yes, sir. Absolutely. If there's a wiki link on the page right there that you can see on the left, and so you can reach the wiki, it's wiki.openstreetmap.org. And if you use the search engine on that wiki to type GPS reviews, you'll see a long, long list, very detailed list of different GPS devices and how successful or unsuccessful they've been with different aspects of OpenStreetMap. Um, yes, sir. Um, with Google, you can do the point of view thing. I don't know where they collect all Street view, you mean? Okay, yep. Hey, I don't know where they collect all those photos from, but they're, they're fairly complete, and they've got some tracking of those 360 views and things yep. like that. Um, are you doing anything like that? Are you asking people to collect photos uh, as you're going along? What kind of, what kind of sub details do you want? There, there are some people who are doing Street View similar things with OpenStreetMap tools and OpenStreetMap data, uh, but we have no place to put all of those photos or video in the OpenStreetMap server. Um, it's a user-funded uh, project, and servers just don't have the capacity for things like photos for Flickr or videos for Street View. Uh, one more, and we'll try and get back to the slides. Yeah? Uh, how many vectors you have in the At least this many. <laughs> there's a lot. Uh, as is, the uh, database doubles in size just about every six months. Uh, about six gig compressed last time I looked. It's, it's XML, so it gets really big when you decompress it. Yeah. Okay, let's... Uh, so so selecting, selecting an object in the editor here, uh, click once on the boundary of the object, it gets highlighted, and then down on the bottom we see the properties of that object. In this case, it's a building, it's operated by the University of Toronto, it's the Faculty of Applied something. Applied math, and it's called the uh, called the Gal Galbraith Building. Um, and so, uh, if you wanted to add something about that building, you could add add to it right here, and then click the upload button, and it would be contributed to OpenStreetMap. Um, here's a shopping center in uh, Central Toronto. It was previously shown as just a building surrounded by an undifferentiated gray area of unused, undefined um, space. And I knew from personal experience that it was actually a parking lot. Here you can see in the background the aerial, uh, aerial imagery. Can you, you can make that out on the projector? Um, Yahoo very graciously allows us use of their aerial photography to trace objects on OpenStreetMap. So thank you very much, Yahoo. Uh, we really appreciate your support. Um, Google also gave us a bunch of money for a new server, for our database server. Thank you very much, Google. It's really wonderful to have 
the support of people who are also doing online mapping um, for this open source project. So in this case, I traced the outline of the parking area and then defined it as a parking area so that instead of being this kind of um, undifferentiated gray unused area on the map, it's now an undifferentiated gray parking lot. Um, there are lots of resources for OpenStreetMap on the web. Um, the OpenStreetMap wiki is uh, one place. I've uh, blogged about a few uh, things that you can do with OpenStreetMap on my website, shown on the, bo the bottom there. Um, participate in a local mapping party or host one yourself. They're fun. They're a cool way to meet other people interested in location, location-based services, or just learning more about your neighborhood. And thank you so much for your time. I uh, welcome your questions. Yes. Read my blog. Read my blog. Um, I don't think maps are the problem. Yeah, maps are the problem. Yeah, a, a map is just a tool. Yeah. Yes? I used to track waypoints and little disks all over the place. Have you seen that in the Oh, the, 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 yeah. The, those are the official uh, ground reference points. Right, I yeah. I had like hundreds of those maps, but, uh -huh. but that, that was from a virtual, I mean, somebody stole my GPS, so I don't have any idea but I know where they are if I have to go back. Mm hmm Uh, I, I don't see why they couldn't be put in, but because we're, we're generally working from GPS coordinates, I, I don't see what the benefit would be of the, the ground reference points. I know that the, for Canada, the ground reference points are available in a, a file that was contributed by the Canadian government, so we can, we can just upload them by... Um... Do you guys use movies or something? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I haven't seen them. With them. I don't know what, what the, the symbols are that are on them. Uh, yes? Do you have any, next. Um, any kind of like... Uh, do list uh, location on your website where it's like, oh, this area really needs some help, you know, so we know where we might go in our area that really hasn't been mapped well yet, the neighborhood or anything. The, the best way to find out what you need to map locally is just to look on the map locally because if you're, when you're familiar with an area, you can look at the map and say, oh, Richard, you idiot, you haven't mapped such and such, and then just go out and do it. Um, but, uh, but things that can almost always be added to the map that really add um, functionality of the map are things like addressing. So um, the, the campus may be really well mapped, but do we have the street addresses for all of the buildings? There's a way now to put that information into OpenStreetMap so that people can use the search engine to find it. Uh, yes, sir? I, I disagree. I think we have more detail. Uh, maybe, yeah. I think mega cities, I agree, but maybe some smaller places, they have caught up maybe. And the other thing I think we have to help them is they also have something that users adding map uh, on the browser itself. Mm -hmm. And they also have the backup of the satellite imagery. Mm -hmm. So it's easier for people to just map, map it without actually going in with the GPS. Mm -hmm. So, okay, my questions are, first of all, uh, no, give me the hard one. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So, is it possible now? Okay, I'm, I'm from the machine learning and in the digital image processing community. So, my question now is I've been reading kind of, I mean, maybe three or four papers regarding the same thing. And if you had noticed, maybe Google these days have uh, a kind of a pro geometric projection of even buildings in their street maps. Mm -hmm. And they're doing that using. Uh, Image, I mean, image processing technique. So they get satellite imagery and convert that using computer uh, vision algorithm to convert it to uh, such. And have you thought about anything of that sort? Okay, that was a long setup for that question. Um, there's, there's nothing stopping you from doing that with OpenStreetMap. Um, I'm not aware of anybody who is doing 3D projections of buildings. We do building outlines as well, uh, obviously. We, we do already have building outlines in OpenStreetMap. Um, sounds like an interesting add-on project if you wanted to contribute some code for that. Uh, yeah, the question is, is that uh, now at this point, you're doing everything manually, right? That is GPS. You take it from GPS, and there's no... Uh, an, an awful lot of really important contributions can only come from people on the ground. 
because they're, they're contributing the data, but they're also contributing the love that goes into that data, and that's really important. Um, but we've also had automated contributions from some big uh, and important data sets, like the road network for the United States came largely from the Tiger data set, which is a public domain data set. The um, National Mapping Agency of Canada, Geobase, uh, contributed the Canadian road network and other data, and we're currently converting and importing that data to OpenStreetMap. The, you may have noticed in the animation that India, the road network appeared all at once. That, a lot of that was contributed by uh, automotive navigation data, a mapping company in the Netherlands. So, um, so we do have sources other than individual contributors, but the individual contributors are really the important part, part because they are contributing things that real people care about. They're caring enough to contribute it not just the road network. And the, the road network's interesting. Once, once you've gotten to where you're going, what do you care about the road network? It's not about the road in front of grandma's house. It's about grandma's house. OK? Um, yes? Yeah, well, well you, just, you kind of led me to this, because um, you want to do an extension for your data set. Um, have you left space in your structure for doing those extensions? Is it easy to extend? What you've got there, obviously, is an XML database. It's, um, it's an open source project, so patch is welcome, always. Uh, it's uh, it, the data set, the way we tag objects in the data set is actually a folksonomy. So rather than defining a taxonomy and saying, this is how you must define the data and this is the way it shall always be, the official policy is do whatever you like with the tagging. You know, if, if, you wanna, if you don't want to call it a building and you want to call it an edifice instead, go for it. You're free to do it. Nobody's going to tell you that you're wrong. It won't show up in the default renderings. But if, if, it's, if you want to put in custom data that's important to you in a way that makes sense to you that doesn't follow the community standards, you can do that. And then you can modify the renderer so that it shows up in a way that's important to you on your copy of the map. The general purpose map, which shows up by default on OpenStreetMap, will never show it, though, because it's something too specific or too strange or too localized, and, and it just won't show up in the default renderer. Right. Is there, is there a committee or a board that decides what shows up in the default renderer? Is there, is it's an open source project, so there's it, it, there might be something like a committee, but it's also something like mob rule. Okay. So, yeah, in a friendly way. It's friendly, <laughs> friendly mob rule. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Uh, there are two renderers that are used um, currently in OpenStreetMap. One is called Mapnik. That's a general purpose map rendering project. And they use style sheets that are uh, very much XML-ish. Um, and they also import uh, other graphics to, to mix into the rendering that they're doing with the, the shapefiles. There's another one that's homegrown at OpenStreetMap called Osma Render. And it's actually a distributed rendering project, so it's kind of interesting from a distributed computing point of view as well as from a GIS point of view. Um, and, and so have a look at Osma Render and Mapnik um, if you want to get into the uh, cartography of OpenStreetMap. Uh, were, were there any questions? Yeah. Not that I'm aware of. Um, not that I'm aware of. I, I know we do have the right tags for tunnels. We can, we can absolutely, we can represent tunnels very nicely in the database, but I'm not aware of anybody um, mapping those tunnels. I, I don't see what would be unlawful about mapping those tunnels. As long as those tunnels actually exist, I want them in the map. Yeah, they, they might find it interesting too. Yes, ma'am. I know that you can opt out to have your home not put on Google and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. How about this? Well, you can edit it yourself. <laughs> but you might end up doing like that guy once. It could be Cyprus all over again, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
With, um, were there some other questions? Yes. In OpenStreetMap? Yeah. Yep. Uh, do you know for a fact that the address that you're looking for is already in the database? I do because I put it in. Okay. Um, please help us with this. Please help us with the search function. <laughs> we we know that there are improvements to be made okay. with the search function that's on the website. Please pitch in and help us with that. Um, if you're interested in the code, if you're interested in diving in. Uh, it's all in the Subversion repository. There is code in there in C, in C++. There are shell scripts. There is stuff in Perl, Python, PHP, uh, Ruby on Rails. Uh, I don't think there's any COBOL, but there is some Fortran. Uh, <laughs> there's probably some Pascal. And somebody wrote something in mumps. I had no idea what mumps is, but apparently it's used in uh, medical, uh, medical programming. Um, so grab, go, so go and grab the um, repository from Subversion and start diving into the code. Uh, the folks on IRC shown up there, and the folks on the mailing lists are fantastic. So you'll get lots of conversation about the things that you're interested in with uh, developing for OpenStreetMap. I'm going to go to you first, and then and then you. Elevation. Right. Is there any plans to actually be able to incorporate that into the OpenStreetMap for people that might actually need to use that information for, say, site plans? People seem to be having a lot of success with bringing in the elevation data as a separate layer and then using it in house rather than requiring that it be in OpenStreetMap. So I don't know that there would be interest in putting that data into OpenStreetMap. That being said, that may change. So I'm not aware of any plans to put the elevation data in, but I don't think it's been completely ruled out either. Uh, yes? Alex, you said you were doing distributed for every rend rendering with the... Yeah, one of the renderers is distributed, yeah. Are you, are you distributing the actual data to local... Yes. ...localization? Like, for instance, if I, if I open up open source... ...on your web, is that going to be something in Europe I'm going to pick up? That map? That no, it... Here? Currently, that would all come from the main server in uh, London, England. The, the main server is right now at the University College of London uh, in London, England. Um, there's some talk and some interest in having the OpenStreetMap default servers um, uh, distributed around the globe. Certainly, it, it makes sense from a network traffic point of view and certainly from a load point of view because we, we keep um, topping out the, the abilities of our servers because the project's growing so quickly. Um, I think I may have one, f time for one or two more short questions and then lots of conversation back at the Ontario Linux Fest booth. Because I can talk about OpenStreetMap all day. Just watch me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, no more questions. Oh, one more? Yep. Does OpenStreetMap have uh, a means of, of you being able to download their data set of everything you've got? Absolutely. Um, every week there is a snapshot of the database taken. We call it the planet file because it's the map of the whole planet. Isn't that clever? Um, and you can get that from a, a mirror. Uh, so that, I think, is every Wednesday morning. You can download a fresh snapshot of the data. If you are running OpenStreetMap tools locally, uh, you can actually get the, those weekly updates, but you can get daily, hourly, and minutely updates if you want them. Yep. Mm -hmm. So kind of fun if you, want to, uh, if you want to get involved at that level. One last question, then we're going to roll. Yep. Yes. It's an XML file. It's got yeah. a lot of pointy brackets. Yeah. A lot of pointy brackets. Yeah. So, so if if you're interested just in a smaller area, you can also get extract files that aren't the complete planet file, um, and and so either get the planet file and distill it down to the area that you care about, or get an extract from somebody who's already. Um, limited the planet file to the area that you care about. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you also to the folks here at uh, Southeast Linux Fest. Um, I know a little bit about what goes into planning this sort of a Linux event, and I invite you to join us at ours.
September or October 24th in Toronto. Come join us at Ontario Linux Fest. That's Tux looking out of the outline of Ontario. Okay. So thank you very much. This work was recorded by View Digital Media and is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike version 3.0. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org.